question. Okay, so once again, good morning and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Chadomir Marko. I'm a researcher at the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory. And I have a huge honor of moderating this first round table of our conference. The title of this round table is, as Irena said, Participatory Democratic Innovations in Southeastern Europe. And we plan for it to serve as sort of an um, introductory um, presentation for a variety of topics that we will be covering in the following few days. So in line with the aims of the conference, uh, the focus of this round table will be on joining different perspectives on and experiences with participa participation and democratic innovations in the region. And to do this, we invited four speakers who can provide a variety of theoretical, empirical, and practical insights into the issues of deliberative and participatory forms of democratic innovations. So we have uh, Damir Kapicic here with us, who is an associate professor of comparative politics at the Faculty of Political Science at the Uni University of Sarajevo. His research focuses on ethnic conflict, uh, political parties, and power sharing, among other things. Uh, Yelena Vasiljevic is also with us. She is a senior research associate at the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory. Uh, she researches citizenship transformations in the post-Yugoslav states, civic engagement and social movements in Southeast Europe. Um, next, we have Carlo Kral, who is a PhD candidate in political science and sociology at the Department of Social and Political Sciences at the Scuola Normale Superiore, I guess. Uh, his research interests include radical left, social movements, and strategic interactions in activism. And finally, another colleague from the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory, um, Vujo Ilic, uh, who researches political conflict and violence, and whose work experience extends to democratic institutions, as well as electoral and party politics. And I would like to, I'm, I'm very excited to welcome you all, and I'm looking forward to this discussion. And I want to start with Buyo, and I want to ask you to start things off by highlighting some key trends um, when it comes to institutional and non-institutional forms of civic participation in Serbia and other countries in the region. Yeah, thank you, Chadomir. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, yeah, it's great that you asked me that because I have prepared the presentation. And uh, it's <laughs> such a coincidence, really. It's such yes. a coincidence. Uh, none of this is scripted, really. Uh, so, so I just wanted to maybe just warm us up with some with some data from pretty much you know sources that you all know varieties of democracy and uh, uh, turnout and and European social survey because uh, I think like we're going to have a lot of discussion about cases uh, from from the Western Balkans or Southeastern Europeans region and then I would just like to maybe provide a, a, a wider context. I mean the main context that we're talking about here is this democratic backsliding or the autocratization process. And here you can see the, the last five years of varieties of democracy, electoral democracy index. I mean, electoral democracy is just one of the five essential elements of, of representative democracy according to the varieties of democracy, the remaining four being a liberal, deliberative, egalitarian, and participatory. And, and this index basically captures the freedom of association and freedom of expression, the, the clean elections, elected officials, and the voter suffrage. And I, I mean, uh, when you look at it, this is what we all focus on usually when we talk about the democracy, for better or worse, of course. And here you can see basically three groups of countries. Uh, in the top, there is Slovenia and, and Croatia above uh, uh, 0 0.75. In the middle is Montenegro and Hungary, and uh, Serbia is, is down there closing to the bottom. And of course, I'm not including the other Western Balkan countries, not that because I don't particularly like them, but because we don't have European social survey data. So sorry for that. But I think the, 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 the trends are quite similar. And also what you can see here is, is that with Croatia and Montenegro, when we have transfers of power that happened in, in, in the last couple of years, there are like these little ticks that basically tell us that, that something about this electoral democracy is, is, is working better. Uh, but this is not the same thing when we when we discuss participatory democracy index. I mean, uh, here this index captures the civil society participation, uh, the elected local government power, and direct popular rule. And I'm sure most of you would not be particularly happy whether this really represents participatory democracy or not. Uh, but at least it tries to grapple with this issue of having 
the concept of democracy where representatives are elected and then there is no continuing uh, uh, contact with them by the waters and they're controlled simply by the checks and balances and not by the waters themselves. And, and here the participatory democracy index is lower for, for, for all countries. Uh, the y-axis is the same, so, so basically you can see that, that it's, uh, it's, it's below. Um, and it's also kind of associated to the electoral index. It's also basically tied in, in, in the way that the variety of, of democracies is calculating it. And the transfers of power don't lead to changes in this index. So we have maybe perhaps longer processes or maybe it's unrelated to what we see on the surface with the elections and the transfers of power and big electoral mobilization. Um, and I think we can see this uh, uh, qu quite well here. This is uh, IDEA uh, data on voter turnout um, uh, based on registered voters. Um, and I think it's important because surveys done uh, in, in most of these countries tell us that, that, that the main instrument the respondents think uh, they can have an impact on politics is usually the elections. Second is usually the media, which I think is only the proxy of, of elections. I mean, if you raise a, an, an, an issue with the media, it will either hurt or, or benefit some of, the, some of the political parties. So this is how, how respondents usually see uh, their, their potential to, to uh, affect the politics. And, and participating in the elections is basically equated with, with, the, with uh, democracy, which is an issue in itself. Um, and as you can see here, participation in, in, in elections is it's, it's quite high in the whole region. Uh, it's above uh, 50 percent uh, uh, in, in, in all of these countries. Um, you can see here the data for the three last parliamentary elections. And in average, I mean, uh, Montenegro and Hungary have, uh, have the highest turnouts. Uh, Slovenia is in the middle and Croatia and Serbia have, have the lowest uh, turnouts in the, last, in the last decades. And there are also like notable highs and lows. Croatia has a downwards trend. Uh, Serbia and Croatia had these 2020 elections in the middle of, of the pandemic, which really, uh, which are the only elections with below 50% uh, turnout. But uh, on the other hand, in Montenegro, the, 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 this is amazing turnout of 77% in the, in the autumn with, uh, with the transfer of power. Again, based on registered voters and not uh, uh, adult, uh, adult population. And, uh, and uh, Slovenia also had a very high turnout in, in their last elections, which j just happened right now, uh, 70%. Hung Hungary is basically stagnating, which is again, what we can infer here is that these big transfers of power happen when there is a high election turnout and when there is not, as in case of Hungary, it just doesn't happen. Um, But let me turn to, 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 to some of the uh, European social survey data because I think it helps us see maybe a better, in a better way what are the differences between these, these countries. These are the, the, the latest two, 2018 round uh, data from European social survey. Uh, and this chart shows us the satisfaction with how democracy works in the country. I just, I just took out the positive attitude. So based on six to 10 uh, grades. Uh, uh, it's all weighted uh, by, by the regular uh, weights for, for ESS. And you can see a little bit different picture here emerging. Uh, um, uh, Croatia and Serbia has the lowest satisfaction with democracy and the other three countries have high. So, so, so you can already see that, that it's different from how we evaluate democracy in the country, how experts evaluate democracy in the country, especially electoral, and how citizens themselves uh, view view uh, view democracy. So it's not fully related, but it is, I think, somehow maybe related to electoral mobilization. The more people participate in elections, they might have. Uh, uh, it might be related to more satisfaction with uh, with democracy. So how is uh, participatory democracy uh, related to this? When we think about it, we can we can think about. Um, um, uh, sorry. Um, depending on, on, the, on the interest of citizens in politics and their willingness and capacities to participate in political life. Um, and if we look at the, the interest, uh, external and internal political efficiency, we can get some useful information from the ESS data regarding the Western Balkans and Southeast Europe. Um, the interest uh, largely corresponds, uh, corresponds to these large assessments of democracy, as you can see in these charts, Slovenia and, and Croatia. Uh, the respondents uh, show the, the, the highest interest in democracy, while the other three countries that have lower, uh, that have 
further progressed in the processes of autocratization in the last five or ten years, there is lower interest in politics, which I think makes sense to, to, to a degree. The, the more uh, citizens lose uh, uh, the sense that things can be changed through politics and through elections, the more disinterested in politics, the more passivization there can be. And it's, of course, a big discussion whether this is intentional product of, uh, of uh, autocrats or, or simply some other um, uh, factors. Um, when we look at the external political efficacy, I think these three variables really helps us um, understand the, the, these differences between electoral participation and non-electoral participation. Uh, these three uh, 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 bars uh, show, uh, show uh, three things. Uh, um, on the left side is, is that uh, the percentage of people that agree that political system allows people to have a say in what the government does. The second one, the gray one, is uh, that political system allows people to have influence on politics. And the third one is that the political system in the country ensures everyone fair chance to participate in politics. And you can see that the third one, the last one, it's, it's, it's much higher than all the other one, which is basically, again, related to this idea that everybody can participate in elections. But whether people actually think that they can uh, have a say in what the government does, whether people think that, that, that they can have an influence in politics, it's, it's, it's much lower, basically. Um, and again, uh, some unexpected twists, I think. Montenegro has the highest percentages here, uh, together with, with Hungary. So, so not the you know, uh, democratic champions of the region, but those kind of in the middle. Whereas Croatia, it's really ridiculously low. I don't know, maybe we can get some contextual knowledge here. I'm, I'm just taking stuff from the, from the database, but I'm, I'm really curious. Like, why is, why is Croatia so, so, so low on, on external efficacy and uh, per, on perception of, yes, thank you. And, and then we have finally the, the, the internal political efficacy or, 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 or how much people think or how much confidence they have in their own ability to participate in politics and ability to take active role in, in political organization. Again, we have Montenegro with the highest confidence and highest uh, ability. Croatia, the lowest, and the remaining three in the middle. So again, it's not really in line with what we would expect based on what we know about states of democracy in these three countries. Uh, uh, countries. So I think it really raises some questions, for me at least, and uh, maybe we will hear some of the answers during this uh, conference. I mean, why is that so? Uh, uh, Slovenia uh, and, and, and Croatia, uh, 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 Slovenia and uh, and Serbia, which are highest and lowest rated in democracy rankings, uh, have almost identical scores when it comes to internal efficacy or the ability and capacity of people to, to, to participate. While Montenegro is really comfortably uh, in the middle after 30 years of uninterrupted rule of, of a single party. Uh, so that's what I would basically finish with, with, with this introductory remarks. I, I hope I didn't take too much time. I think it's really uh, an issue that we have to deal with, that, that when we talk about democracy, we usually focus on the electoral side of democracy and lose sight of all of this uh, rich variation between countries when it comes to participatory uh, democracy. Uh, electoral mobilization, sure, uh, varies across countries, but what we can see here is this underlying, really important, low, uh, uh, low uh, uh, internal efficacy or expectation of people that, that they can uh, affect, that they can influence politics and that they are capable of, of doing so. Uh, and so uh, that's what I would like to finish with. I'm not sure about the relation between autocratization and participatory democracy, whether there is any, and if there is, what kind of direction does it have? Does it, does it reduces participatory democracy or, or increases? And whether that means that one can have a positive or negative effect on this democratic process. And thank you very much. Thank you so much. So you raised so many interesting questions. Um, if we wanted to cover all of them now, I think we, we would we would be way above our um, time frame for today. So before we try and do that, um, let's move on to some specific cases that we wanted to cover today. So we know that in recent years, uh, we have seen that more and more countries are using these innovative forms of uh, democratic, I mean, I mean uh, democratic innovations to address um, some of the problems of representative democracy that Guyo has mentioned. 
and we have some um, similar experiences or similar efforts in the region as well. So Bosnia had a very recent experience with its assemblies, uh, both on local and national level. Uh, they dealt with diverse issues that include cleansiness in public places, for instance, but also more sensitive topics like electoral and constitutional reform. So I would like to ask Damir to share his reflections on this process and to give us the main, the main takeaways from citizen assemblies in Bosnia. Thank you, Chedo. So um, I'll basically catch up where Buyo left off in all of this um, lack of electoral sort of support from the population and what you can see this lack of trust in the political system that you can actually make a change. Uh, we have specifically two cases in Bosnia where we did have citizen assemblies and where citizens were for a very long time not able to participate and to take part in this. One was uh, the case of Mostar, which is a city in Herzegovina in the, in the south, where there haven't been elections for eight years, where the government basically did not have the legitimacy to rule and where citizens assemblies were seen as a way to bridge that and to be to give citizens a voice to try to influence politics. And the others on the state level with electoral and constitutional reform, where following the verdict of the European Court for Human Rights on Sidic and Finci, there has been no implementation for over 10 years, and where governments were continuously not able to deal with that issue. So having a citizens assembly on that was the second one that we had. So there have been two citizens assemblies in Bosnia and Herzegovina in the past two years to start off with that. These are innovative forms of democracy, of deliberative democracy, where citizens get together, they talk about issues, and they make recommendations. Um, but first to give you a sense of how this looks like, I have a video on one of them, on the state level one. I think that we'll see this one. It's a short three minute video, just to give you a sense of how this, how this works. Okay. It's buffering, so 
maybe we can just leave the audio off and if it sort of gets going again, we'll have that in the background. So you see that this is sort of a very participatory way of doing things. It's not frontal. You see the people communicating with each other and walking around and basically sharing their ideas. The idea here is to try to give an alternative way to come to policy solutions that go beyond the typical uh, forum of representative democracy. And usually what are chosen are issues that are either divisive among society or that are problematic that uh, elected leaders could not solve. Now I'll focus more on the local level one in Mostar, which I think also you have in some of your materials. The state level one, by the way, is something that I usually also tend to call a way, an experiment, a way that you try to do something without full political support from the elected leaders. And this is something that I'll talk probably in the discussion, this commitment that you do need to implement the results as well. In Mostar, we had a, you could say, a lucky coincidence. Just as the Citizens' Assembly was getting underway, we had a government in the city being formed. So the city council got elected and we had a mayor. We had somebody to talk to. Um, by the way, the Citizens' Assembly of Mostar, it was organized by the Council of Europe and the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities. It was a way to try to engage with citizens and to strengthen democracy at the local level. It's a part of the program that the Council of Europe does. And the way that they tried to do this is to strengthen both the capacity of citizens, but then also of elected leaders. So they're working with both sides on that end. And the first thing was basically to choose a topic. This was very sort of innovative in Mostar as well, that nobody gave the citizens the topic that they should discuss. Citizens were asked directly, first through online polling, then through separate discussions with civic society organizations, and later on through, um, through an in-person poll, what topics they think are most relevant for that city. And you got a list of 20 different topics, ranging from corruption to infrastructure. The one that was chosen as the most relevant one was city cleanliness. Something that might sound out of place, but in Mostar, if you think about the context and read into it, it is a major issue. City cleanliness and maintenance of public spaces. And this was the topic that they deliberated on in July 2021. The way that you do this deliberation, basically, is that first you start off with a learning phase. So basically the participants, there was 44 of them in Mostar, also got together in a very similar setting to what we see up here. And they learned from experts, from city planners, from people who deal with city administration, and then also from people from other communities. So others' experiences on how they could solve, have solved these issues, sort of best practices. By learning and by also learning what their city is able to offer, they were then able to sort of reflect on, on what solutions they can come up with. After their learning phase, you have sort of a short break. This is why citizens' assemblies don't usually go last in sort of one go, but you have a break in between different sessions where they can reflect, they can consult, they can go back to their communities, to their neighborhood, their families, their friends, and talk about this with them so that you engage a broader audience as well. Um, and finally, for sort of the last stage, you have a deliberative stage. In the deliberative sta stage, citizens offer solutions. They offer policy-related solutions on how you can solve certain issues. And in this way, you end up with a set of recommendations that they all vote on. And both citizens' assemblies, the one in Mostar, they voted in 32 recommendations on how to solve the issues of public spaces and their maintenance and cleanliness. But also this assembly, which you see here, they had 15 recommendations on how to change the constitution of the country and how to uh, change our electoral laws. All of this gets voted by the citizens. And usually you have a higher threshold there that you need a larger amount of support for any of these to be implemented. It's not just 50 plus one, the typical representative formula. You usually have at least two thirds or even more than that or with veto provisions. That's one thing. And once you have these recommendations, you have to present them again. And this is where this connection with the local authorities in Mostar proved to be crucial because you could present it to them directly, 
you could engage with them, explain why these issues, why these recommendations matter, and why you have actually come up with these solutions. So it's not just about giving them the solution, as we often do, but explaining it to them in a way that relates back to the citizens who made this. What I always say, it's not us experts who should talk about the recommendations, it is the citizens who actually made them. In Mostar, in November 1920, uh, 2021, the city council actually adopted a plan to implement all 32 recommendations made by the citizens. And they're now working on a strategy on how to move forward. Some of them have already, already been implemented, sort of very simple, basic solutions. Others that require time and funding, uh, those will necessarily need more time to be implemented. But you can see that it has made an impact and that they has been able to sort of push this uh, way of doing politics in Mostar a bit forward. Mostar, which hadn't had a legitimate government for eight years, is all of a sudden sort of the front runner of democratic innovations, not just in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also in the region. The next citizens assembly in Mostar will be held next year. So there's also a plan to move forward with this, not to have it as a one step, uh, no, one time thing, but to make it a little bit more institutionalized. So I'll leave it at that and we'll keep the rest for the discussion. Thank you so much for this uh, very useful overview of the, of the process of organized citizen assemblies. And we have a great opportunity today to actually uh, compare experiences because um, citizens assemblies were also held in Serbia recently and within this project active citizens Active citizenship, promoting and advancing, advancing innovative democratic practices in the Western Balkans. And Yelena comes here with first-hand experience, so I want to ask her the same question that I asked Damir, and that is to share her thoughts on what this process looked like in Serbia. Thank you. Uh, it's, it would be interesting to, to maybe compare these cases, but there are some limitations to, to, uh, to, to, to possibilities of comparing them because uh, citizens' assemblies in Serbia were solely an academic endeavor. So there was no democracy promoting actor behind it or body behind it. And that kind of influenced us because it was us, this institute who organized it as a sort of a quasi experiment and we had limited resources, of course. And that also I had, had I think that that had an impact on, uh, on the, the, the public authorities answering our calls to, to participate uh, in the whole uh, event. So uh, let me just, Tell you briefly about also about the context. So okay, we we talked about uh, possibilities and uh, uh, of, or, and and outcomes of organizing uh, citizens assemblies or similar deliberative bodies in what we call hybrid regime or authoritarian whatever hybrid regime is an umbrella term to, to indicate there's both elements of democracy and autocratic tendencies. But you have to understand that, it, that in Serbia is really characterized by, characterized by a very, very strong democratic backslide that in many respects is an outlier in the region. And I think that what is important for the context of understanding the, the outcomes and the processes of citizens' assemblies is not only that it's a hybrid regime with autocratic elements, but it's also a state capture society in the society with with where institutions are captured, but also where public discourse is captured and controlled. So the flow of information is very much control and how citizens access information and how they gain their, their knowledge. So this is the context which is very much important. And within that context, we as an academic institution organized two, um, two citizens assemblies. They were not really proper citizens assemblies, the proper sense of the world. They were not deliber deliberative meaning public. We communicated them as citizens assemblies to the citizens because uh, it's more understandable to them. Uh, they lasted for one day. They were organized in Valjevo and in Belgrade. And uh, we decided to uh, make, uh, make an innovation to kind of deviate from the standard design of citizens' assemblies. We wanted to overrepresent so-called active citizens or representatives of uh, civil movements because of various reasons. Uh, one of the tenets of the whole project was that in societies like Serbia, uh, uh, institutional politics, people don't have faith and they don't trust institutional channels of politics, but there's a growing, uh, the, the, the growing trend of uh, self-organized local civic initiatives and citizens tend to trust them more, or they're the ones who articulate problems and they're the ones who also address issues and they're the ones who convey information about certain topics. So we wanted to include them and to include them in the, in, in the uh, citizens' assemblies and to have representatives of them as also participants. So they, they were part of the discussion groups. So we choose two topics. 
that were important in, in public, that uh, were that also caused some kind of polarization that citizens were interested in, but also that we have civic uh, civic movements and uh, uh, social movements articulating these issues. So in Belgrade, we organized one citizens' assembly on a uh, city official plan to uh, expand pedestrian zone in the city center. An invaluable topic was the air pollution. So there were also uh, two different cases. Uh, we also wanted to compare these differences because in the case of air pollution, it's locally important topic, but it's also a topic that you cannot really completely, it's uh, obviously air pollution that cannot stay only in one place, but in, in places like Valle, it was a, especially a problem. And whereas the rerouting of traffic and expansion of pedestrian zone, it's a different kind of topic where uh, when you gain some information, then you can change your opinions or your opinions and, and political preferences regarding the subject will depend on the type of information that you get and you can have these or that preferences. Whereas in case of air pollution, it's more like technical information that you need to be more informed. So we wanted to compare this. Let me just say from the, from the outset that uh, the uh, already in the first phase where we were, we were preparing briefing materials to be handed out to those who would participate, uh, we had no response from uh, representatives of, uh, of public officials and of, of well, politicians basically. So they, uh, they did not answer our uh, pleas to comment briefing materials, to, to participate in it because the idea was to form, of course, biased, non-biased, uh, balanced information about the topic and we wanted to include uh, perspectives and opinions of, of all the stakeholders. And while expert community responded and made their comments and their comments were, uh, were incorporated in the briefing materials, politicians did not respond at all. And then when we organized uh, these assemblies, also politicians, for instance, in Valjevo, they didn't show up at all. So they didn't want to participate in the process. In Belgrade, in the case of Belgrade City Assembly, one representative did show up and participated, but he was reluctant to answer any questions raised by citizens. And that didn't go unnoticed, of course, because of the plan sessions after the discussion with the stakeholders, citizens in their discussion groups comment on that and they were frustrated uh, uh, with this idea. And uh, uh, But on the other hand, they were very satisfied with the way they communicated with experts and with expert communities. And they found their inputs very useful. And as our analysis showed, they, the, the inputs from the expert community actually made an impact on citizens' attitudes on these, the, these topics. And also what is very important that even though uh, this experience with, uh, with politicians uh, kind of, uh, you would expect that to even further diminish their faith in uh, participation because their reactions were, were going along the line. Okay, so they were not present. They don't. They are not. They don't care what we say. So why why should we participate when we cannot? So it's obvious that we cannot influence them. It's obvious that our participation had have no effect. Even though these these narratives were present, other narratives were present as well, and they they and it, they went along the lines. Yes, but we have to practice this kind of communication. We have to pretend as if the politicians are accountable because regimes will change and we have to insist on our capacity as citizens to communicate with, uh, with all the stakeholders and to insist that our, that our uh, positions are taking, uh, uh, taken into account. Uh, so I would say that even, even though Serbian society can be characterized as the one with very low deliberative capacities, so very low capacities to, uh, to, to organize an authentic deliberation with outcomes, with very tangible outcomes, there is the appetite for deliberation. The citizens really want to, to participate. And maybe I can talk about specific outcomes, about what we measured and the, what, uh, what were the... Uh, the results uh, in terms of attitudes, preferences, etc. Maybe we can talk about that in the second round of discussion. Yeah, sure. So this was, this was really interesting. Buyo was talking about um, external and internal political efficacy. And now we hear how, if I understood correctly, in the case of Serbian citizens assemblies, so it seems that there was a negative influence of their sense of political efficacy because they saw politicians first reluctant to, to join and then even if they were present, they didn't participate. At the same time, it seems that there was a positive influence on internal political efficacy. 
because they, they felt good about the process, they felt like raising their capacities for, for political participation. And also, sorry if I just want to add another line, because they were able to formulate very concrete policy mm -hmm. proposals. So it began with, uh, with the, uh, especially in the case of city, uh, Belgrade, uh, Belgrade case, uh, they didn't have enough information. And then after the group discussions, after the consultations with experts, uh, and after the second round also plenary session with other stakeholders, they were able to understand uh, the situation more, uh, the, the whole problem and the topic uh, with more nuances, and they were able to, to, uh, to formulate very, very concrete proposals. And what was also interesting in the case of, of Belgrade, the city assembly, is that they, they were not discussing only the topic. So you have a topic like expansion of pedestrian zones, should we do it or not? Uh, if we do it, uh, under what conditions? So that would be like discussing the specificities of a topic, but actually what they discussed most is the way the whole project has been laid out. So they criticized the non-transparency, non-consultancy of the whole, the, the, the whole process was, and so they, in a way, they discussed and the deliberation was not only about the topic, it was about the, the nature of uh, or making this, uh, the nature of, of, of how decision-making processes are being held. So this is also another very important aspect, I would say, of this. Case study for like. political learning. Yes, exactly. Um, so we heard um, two very specific cases with early implementations of democratic innovations, and I want to bring in Carlo. And I know that one of the topics that interests him are is the role of um, democratic collective actors, such as social movements, in promoting um, this kind of democratic innovation. So would you like to tell us more about, about that? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, first and foremost. Uh, the way I understood my role in, in this panel is to give a kind of broader perspective of social movement studies in general um, <coughs> beyond this specific type of democratic innovation that Damir and Jelena uh, were talking about right now. Indeed, what we've seen over the past decade uh, is an increasing creativity of social movements in uh, uh, creating various democratic innovations from crowdsourced constitutionalism in Iceland to uh, hybrid forms of organizing, combining social movements and political parties to referendums from below. Uh, so what we see is actually a number of very interesting cases of democratic innovation that are steered by social movements or these kind of collective actors. Um, and what I'm really interested in is understanding about <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what I'm really interested in is understanding what are the limits of these uh, democratic innovations. And this is how I uh, articulated my, uh, my contribution for today. Uh, and I think here the sense of political efficacy, or um, I would say the sense of a citizen's agency seems really crucial. Uh, and while I was reading the special issue of philosophy and society, which I really enjoyed, uh, uh, what I noticed in several uh, contributions uh, about this experience of deliberative mini-publics is exactly this issue, that while the citizens were uh, uh, positively influenced by this experience, they felt they learned a lot, they have enhanced their special, specialist knowledge, uh, it seems that this sense of political efficacy remains a really burning issue in terms of motivating people to participate. Um, and indeed, I think, uh, of course, uh, I'm also one of the scholars working on Southeastern Europe, and I'm always kind of insisting that this is a specific context, that we have to be very careful about it. But I also believe this kind of low sense of political efficacy is a global phenomenon. And if we think about uh, the way uh, this can be described, I think the best example of this description actually comes from colleagues from the Institute here, this idea of neoliberal instrumentalism as a predominant discourse that we, uh, uh, this, this period in which basically um, uh, we are reliving the 80s and there is no alternative uh, in, in many ways. Uh, and I think this was best articulated by Wendy Brown, a political theorist who claims that what we've seen over the last three or four decades globally is the stealth revolution of neoliberalism. Um, and I think she's uh, really uh, eloquently defining the citizen, uh, uh, this kind of neoliberal citizen, by saying that this is the citizen who releases state, law, and economy from responsibility for and responsiveness to its own condition 
and predicaments and is ready when called to sacrifice the cause for the cause of economic growth, competitive positioning and fiscal constraints, uh, end of quote. And I think uh, this kind of neoliberal rationality is maybe even more present in contexts of competitive authoritarianism such as Hungary and Serbia which actually rely on creating and managing these contradictions between uh, extreme neoliberalism, extractivism on the one hand, and very selective redistributive policies that are also clientelist in many ways. Uh, uh, and these regimes really have to rely on multiple dependencies. Uh, both Hungary and Serbia, if we think about them, rely on really various centers of power in order to keep the political, this kind of contradictory economic model to, to go on and, and work. And this is why they are now, in this geopolitical context, they are now in a problem because they kind of cannot rely on this juggling between uh, multiple dependencies. So in that sense, I would say that Serbia is certainly uh, uh, specific uh, and that in Serbia, this model uh, really relies on this course of instrumentalism uh, 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 as, crucial to uh, make sure that citizens do not have a sense of political efficacy because it's a problem if citizens have political efficacy for the regime. Uh, what I see and what I think is increasingly uh, kind of discussed topics uh, is uh, this uh, one of the cases that is so important is the case of do not let Belgrade drown exactly because it's one of the first cases that was able to articulate opposition to this kind of instrumentalism. Uh, and I would say that uh, uh, this capacity of social movements to mobilize through innovative discourses is something that we saw globally uh, as a phenomenon that is really important. But the question is, how much is this sustainable? And you know, how long can we go with this kind of discursive change? And where are the limits of this? Uh, and I believe that uh, here we have to start thinking not only about strategies of mobilizing in the sense of discussing what social movements should do, but also in the sense of organizing. And the difference between mobilizing and organizing is really well articulated by Jane Metalevi, American scholar with experience of organizing within trade unions in the, in the US context, uh, where she, saw, she says that what we need, what we see in many of these mobilizations of social movements uh, is that we get, so we're talking also about democratic innovations here. Uh, what we see is that social movements are really capable of uh, motivating to participate those people who have tendency to participate, who are already in a certain way engaged or privileged or uh, have a position to, to participate. But then the issue is how can we, how can social movements uh, influence the, those citizens who are completely disengaged and whose sense of political efficacy is absolutely low. Uh, and in that sense, what she says is we need this paradigm of organizing, uh, which makes an additional step by engaging more directly in the detection of organic leaders within communities and prioritizes face-to-face -face interaction over digitally mediated interaction and this kind of discursive strategy. Um, in explaining this added value of organizing as compared to mobilizing, Mekalevi points to the difference between self-selecting work typical of mobilizing and structure-based work that she associates with organizing. Uh, in self-selecting work, movement groups spend most of the time talking to people already on their side, whereas in structured-based work that she kind of proposes as a model, because the goal is building majorities of a bounded constituency, organizers are con constantly forced to engage with people who may begin with little or no initial interest in being a part of any group. And I believe this is where we come to the limits of democratic innovations and kind of uh, not, not necessarily their weakness, but something that uh, uh, is an area that I believe uh, really needs to be discussed. So how we move beyond the constituency that already has tendency to participate and already has certain level of political efficacy. And it's in. Thank, thank you so much. So I think we opened several very, very important and key, key topics. We were talking about the importance of political efficacy, both external and internal. 
Uh, we were talking about the importance of democratic innovations to address the, the issues with representative democracy. We were talking about the role of decision makers and their importance for successful outcome of this process. We were also talking about um, all of these problems being global and at the same time the, uh, the importance of reflecting of the nuances of the context. So I think it's the right time to, to invite the audience to join this discussion and um, to see if anyone would like to ask uh, our speakers a question. Okay, we have a question over here. So just, just a second, just a second. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, my question would be, does decentralization, or actually their lack of, especially in the south, southeastern, let's say, western Balkan regions, does that present a really big obstacle in democracy participation? Well, let, let's see if we can, yeah, we have another question over there. So yeah, I think it would be a good idea. Thanks. I mean, I would be curious maybe to get you to um, relate to, to each other's presentation in regard to Vuyo's question, which of course, or question, but presentation, which well raises a question of people being satisfied with um, participation in many ways uh, at electoral politics in countries where we know from an expert's position they shouldn't be. <laughs> um, so why are they satisfied, or why why are they not as dissatisfied as you know as scholars we are with the state of democracy, and what does this tell us for these participatory efforts? Because I mean, you know, does it tell us that you know people just don't understand what is wrong with their democracy? Is it because they are they have no expectation of the system being any better because they have, there's no nothing to refer to, no democratic reference point uh, of a better system? Um, so, I mean, th I think this is, for me, always a fundamental question with a lot of these participatory methods, which, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed by the experimentation, the results I'm hearing, but I'm also always wondering how to close the gap with the institutional politics, which are so removed from them, and the, the lack of response of elected officials is, of course, no surprise, um, when we know that the basic structure of electoral political let's say conventional political structures, be it political parties, be it institutions and their representatives, is so disinterested in most cases in citizens that something so innovative, a citizens assembly, is like, you know, you know, it's like Star Trek flying into, you know, something much, you know, kind of uh, into something which is very basic and, and not interested. So I'm just kind of wondering about these gaps. Maybe you can speak to each other and how you, how you see these, these kind of gaps operating or how they could be bridged by some of those experiments. Thank you so much. May I just please ask you to introduce yourself? So, Gloria yeah. Bieber, sorry. Thank you so much. And we have two more questions right behind. Yeah. But I think that someone behind was first, maybe? A, yeah, yeah. Please okay. So, I'm Ivana Demjanovic from the Faculty of Political Science, University of Belgrade. And I'm very interested, actually, on the topic of limits of democratic innovations in terms of their outcomes. And I think we saw two perspectives here. One is that there is a, a limit regarding the possible number of people who are engaged in participation. And the other, which was already mentioned, and which was mentioned by Yelena and Tamir also, uh, is regarding the irresponsiveness of institutions. Uh, so I'm very interested, uh, what is the opinion of the panel? Uh, which one of these limits is, is maybe easier to overcome, mm -hmm. not in terms of more important because both are important, but which, which, which would be easier to overcome and if they have some ideas how, how to do it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I saw a raise, yeah, over there, Stefan. Um, my name is Stefan Gozwitsa. I'm a junior researcher here at the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory. Uh, and my question, I guess, is somewhat uh, logistical, let's say. Uh, so if we are talking about participation, how do we ensure uh, people's participation in the material sense? Like when there's a citizen's assembly, don't people need to get like time off from work or something like that, especially if they're participating for a prolonged period of time? And then also if we're talking about mobilizing, it's not only an issue of time off, but uh, sorry, not mobilizing, organizing versus mobilizing, 
not only an issue of time off, right, but especially when you're talking about labor organizing, for instance, it's also about, you know, uh, dangers of a loss of work and something like that. And is this also danger in other forms of participation? Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Do we have more questions? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, we have a lot of questions already. So the first one was about, if I understood correctly, the influence of decentralization. On, or the lack thereof. Yeah, or the lack thereof on political participation. Who would like to answer that? Well, that, that such an easy question to answer. Anyway, of course, the, the, the impact is that maybe each of us can go through, through this question. I don't think we will have enough time. Or just to, to yeah, to be, I'll try to be very brief. Yeah, it, it makes, uh, of course, because especially uh, it, it, it has an impact on motivation on people. So why would they, why would they participate in, in, for instance, in smaller cities and smaller localities in participative form or have, if they know that actually the decision-making process is centralized, right? Mm -hmm. So of course it makes an impact. And people are also, other research shows us that people are mostly interested in their local issues and mostly interested in getting involved in things that concern them very practically on their local issues. And if they know that decisions are actually made centrally, that kind of demotivates them additionally. So yeah. I'll, I'll short reply to my question. I mean, of to course. The answer, yeah. Then would then a possible maybe super super local alliance to say so would it be a potential enhancer of democratic participation or decentralization. Or, or well, implementing the just, just just one intervention because the event is hybrid, so you'll have to wait for the microphone. No, ah okay. yes, that's 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 Okay, so would anyone else like to add something to this topic? Of the, no? And then, okay. I just have a very brief uh, uh, no. response to the issue of decentralization. I mean, we need to understand that uh, there is formal decentralization in terms of institutional, yeah. sorry, in terms of institutional bodies that are kind of representing citizens, but there is also substantial decentralization. Uh, and what I see, for instance, in the case of Zagreb, uh, is that you have very high level of formal decentralization in terms of uh, uh, city being divided into hundreds of very local representative bodies, so-called miestni odbori. But the issue is that, substantially speaking, if the decisions of these bodies are not really important, then the level of decentralization in this formal sense doesn't really, uh, uh, I wouldn't say it has any positive impact. On the contrary, it can create more cynicism because people understand that they're asked to participate in bodies that have no substantial impact on what is going on in their lives. So this is even, I would say, this can even be counterproductive if it is used as a, you know, uh, as a way for any, anyone who has power to justify what they're doing. This is, this, this is my answer. Um, the next question was pro from Professor Bieber who asked, uh, every participant to reflect on the finding that we have presented, which tell us that citizens are way more uh, satisfied with how democracy work than what we would expect. So I would like to ask you to, to, to uh, address that issue each from their own perspective. Okay, maybe I can start with this one. Um, also, when we do polling sort of nationally and regionally, we see that citizens in democracies which are more engaged yeah. towards citizens usually have more negative views on democracy than those where democracy is just this four, every four years going to the ballots and throwing in, in uh, the, the uh, sort of electoral vote. And it, I think it relates very much to what citizens understand as democracy, because if you understand democracy only as voting and not actively participating, sure, I mean, it's not that bad, uh, it's bad every four years, but in between that, it's actually, I mean, you have sort of some kind of democracy, but if you see it a bit more broader as also actively participating, and then you see strong pushback from authorities towards this type of participation, this active participation, this is where you get more cynical. This is where you lose trust in democracy, where you say that they don't listen to us, well, continuously don't listen to us, not just during the electoral period, but throughout the four years. And this is why you might see less support for democracy in Croatia, for example, than you do in, in Montenegro or in Serbia. Yes, I agree. It's partly this, but it's also that uh, when uh, we t we're talking about perceptions, right? And we're talking about uh, surveys showing perceptions about 
um, level of satisfaction with democracies. But there are also other researches about other perceptions about other things. So at the same time, will we have, for instance, in Serbia, a relatively high satisfaction with the electoral process, but at the same time, very high levels of distrust towards politicians and, and even, even a resentment of political class. So you have to take into account various different um, indicators, and especially when you deal with, with perceptions, like you have to, I mean, maybe it's me being trained as an anthropologist, so you know, like having a, 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 an outright you know, suspicion, you have to dig deeper and you have to then you then have to, to take into account the complex web of these different indicators. So at the one hand you have this, but also you have this, the idea that political class is completely detached from citizens, that you trust them as well. So you have to take all these into account. <coughs> into account. So I think that, that we should treat it as just a part of a very complex image uh, portraying the, 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 the perceptions about democracy and how politics is done in Southeast Europe. Mm, yeah, maybe I can just reflect on the issue uh, raised by the colleague from Faculty of Political Science about this kind of question, whether if we have two goals, uh, so one to broaden the number of people who participate to include more people, and the other which is closing the gap with institutional politics, and I believe these two goals are closely interrelated uh, in the sense that uh, if uh, we, we want to have responsive institutions, we need very strong collective actors that can sustainably organize relatively large number of people uh, in a way that contests the position of uh, these institutional actors. Of course, given that we are talking about the context uh, of this region in which some countries are competitive authoritarianisms, of course, it is th th there is a layer com of complexity to it, so I wouldn't say it's the same kind of uh, response uh, coming from Slovenian or Croatian perspective and Serbian perspective. Of course, there are differences. But I would say that in all contexts, these two goals are closely interrelated in the sense that one of the key, <laughs> at the end of the day, one of the key powers of social movements are large numbers. This is the thing. And I think uh, uh, collective actors uh, need to find ways how to have large numbers. I, I really believe this is the, the first question that uh, has, to be, has to be answered. Not only large numbers that will come once in a while uh, or every few months, uh, but large numbers that also include diverse demographic, uh, diverse classes, people coming from different parts of the country, not only people who are you know, living in big cities. Um, so yeah, that, that would be my response to this issue of these two goals. It's a very important question. Okay, um, let's stay on that topic and uh, provide further answer to answers to Professor Damiano's question. And that was, we heard these two different experiences and two different problems, and which one is easier to overcome when we when we speak about the outcomes of democratic innovation. So I would also, uh, of course, we will hear from the two of you, but I would also like to hear Buyo's thought on, on, on these issues. So whoever would like to start? It's me. Okay. It's so, yeah. so, so I'm just going to go back a little bit okay. towards these, these previous two questions. I'm, I'm very close to, to, to Damir to, to, when it comes to this puzzle of satisfaction with dysfunctional democracies. I mean, we are talking about the regimes that are basically built on uh, pernicious polarization, the division of society in us versus them. And in that case, we can always count that if, you know, if a turnout is 60% and half of them votes for the ruling part, well, there is always going to be around 30% of the people who will be satisfied with how democracy works. And I, I, I can see that as a more pronounced trend in, in these types of regimes. And the other thing, I think, uh, uh, and again, that poses specific problems for participatory mechanisms and participatory innovations when we operate in surroundings like this. And this is what we're going to talk about at the conference, I think. And, and, and the other thing is really that, that this pernicious polarization is more and more built, I think, on, on uh, urban versus rural divide. There is always this, you know, uh, the regimes are relying increasingly more on, on the rural population for the votes. 
And, and I think it also presents an issue when we think about, so what kind of participatory, I mean, we are talking about uh, participatory innovations in, uh, in these you know, urban surroundings and in online formats and so on. And I think that we need to go step back and think about the, the, the heritage of participatory democracy, which is maybe either through, uh, existed in socialist period or has existed in rural areas for, for decades or for centuries. And again, these, you know, uh, local assemblies and so on are interesting, you know, forms which still exist. And, and even though, you know, these, these, these voters might be voting for the national, you know, uh, autocratic party, there might be some sort of seeds of participatory democracy that might maybe be interesting to, to uh, discuss. Um, I was actually participating in, in, in one of the, in one of the uh, uh, assemblies in, in, in February and, and my personal impression was, was that uh, so, so, so these citizens, as, as Damir said, were, were randomly selected and I was just so impressed with their open-mindedness. Not, not in the sense that, that you know, uh, I think like people are generally open-minded, just that people who are in the ruling, ruling party elites are very close-minded when it comes to being entrenched in, in political positions. And, and th that means basically that, 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 uh, that, that uh, uh, people in Sarajevo had a very, very difficult task. They were discussing the institutional, the constitutional arrangement and, and, and the voting laws in, in a highly ethnicized environment. And they were actually had more <laughs> capacity and ability to discuss about the problems and how to approach problems. And I, I thought that was an amazing thing. And going back to, to, to what Yelena was saying, that really comes to the, that really hits the wall when they are confronted with the political representatives in these types of regimes. This is where the magic you know, stops. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the finding that we had uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the assembly in, in Belgrade. Once they were confronted with, with the elected representatives, their, their uh, assessment of how uh, local democracy works went down. This is the only finding that we actually had, which was uh, substantive. Uh, and, and so I really think we need to think about uh, how, to, how to adapt participatory mechanisms to, to, to these very, very unusual, I think, uh, surroundings. Okay, also just to sort of continue on the set trend and also maybe to ask the question about this practical aspects of organizing it. I don't agree with Carlo, by the way, in terms of that you need a stronger, broader organizing and mobilizing of people. Uh, in this assembly here, we had 57 participants from across the country, from all walks of social life, from every single place. I mean, half of them were from small towns or rural areas where you wouldn't expect any sort of engagement. And they were active. They were not just passively there in the room. We had people who were minors and people who were at some point in their life at least wanting to be professors. So in this sense, you had a very broad spectrum of people, and we did not do this through any type of mobilization, but through something called stratified sortition. And the idea here is to send out a huge number of invitations. We sent out 5,000 letters across the country, sort of random household survey type. And then you have sort of feedback. Who wants to participate? Of course, they don't do this for free you have to sort of give them also some kind of a stipend or daily amount. They're sort of taking time off from their daily work to do something for the community. It has to be rewarded in a way. And this is very, very important. It's key to have this interest that even though you might initially be skeptical towards something, you do it for <coughs> the money, essentially. But then you do get interested. I mean, Vuya was there in the room, and you could see that after a while, he was there for the second day. We had a third day and a fourth day as well they were getting more and more sort of ingrained as a community. They were no longer discussing as city people, rural people, Serbs, Croats, Bosniaks. They were discussing as citizens. And this is key, I mean, to have this very randomly selected group of people, and they represent certain criteria that we set in advance. So they had to be balanced in terms of gender. The age had to represent the age structure of the country, the ethnic makeup ethnic makeup of the country, and all other sort of stratified criteria that you do select. Essentially, what you end up with is what we call a country in a room. In Mostar, we had a city in a room. And this allows you basically to have a representative sample of citizens present. 
the larger the number of citizens present, the more representative you can get. And this is sort of where you then tweak it technically to see how much people you need for it to be representative. For a municipality, 20 to 30 is enough. For a country, you need at least 50, preferably around 100. So in terms of time, all of this was done on weekends. People are much more likely to be able to take time off if it is during the weekend. And of course, you bring them in a setting that is a bit separate from, not in the city center like this, but that is a bit separate from this daily walk of life. That they, as a group, if any of you have done any sort of team building exercises, it looks something like that. It's just that you work as a team towards a certain goal. And basically you end up functioning as a team. And this is sort of the thing where you have both the representativeness of a broad spectrum of society achieved through a very small technical tool. You don't need this broad mobilizing, organizing. You do need that for the implementation part. This is where we sort of might agree on it and where we also see problems that if you don't have this connection towards elected leaders, the implementation doesn't really work. The Mostar Citizens Assembly, we were lucky on that. Really lucky. The first government in eight years needed a form of legitimacy. And they found the legitimacy in communicating towards citizens. Now they're stuck. They can't get out of it anymore. The national level assembly, you had an extremely different experience. Those elected leaders, they, they uh, listened to the recommendations of the citizens, but they decided not to engage with them. They did not debate. They did not ask questions. They just listened to them, and that was it. There was no sort of follow-up, at least not yet. There was no follow-up. Nothing came sort of in a long term out of this because there was no direct engagement with citizens. There was no sort of willingness to do this, neither from progressive parties nor from the more traditional ones that you would expect. Yeah, I just want to give an opportunity to Carlo if he wanted to respond. Yeah, I think actually Damir and myself agree. Uh, my point was not to say, I, I was not uh, kind of trying to make a, a point about the effect that people are, uh, you know, kind of the kind of effect that this experience has on people within the liberative mini publics. I was talking more broadly about exactly this issue of how we, uh, uh, so what I see is that within the liberative mini publics, there was a lot of emancipation in terms of understanding uh, complex policy processes, expertise, uh, learning how to articulate proposals and this is of course very important but then another like next step in emancipation is when you say um, I have power to influence uh, I have power to participate and I think uh, this step is uh, uh, something that you know this is this is uh, this is the thing I was kind of trying to add up to, to your experience so yeah um. And would you like to add something? Yeah, I would just like to, to, to connect uh, even and step as well, just because they actually speak to the same issue and there's the limitations of, uh, uh, of uh, democratic innovations. And I think that it's, first of all, we have to admit that. So you cannot always involve a lot of people and you cannot always expect uh, the results of these uh, uh, assemblies to have an immediate effect on, on policymakers. Uh, so there are certain limitations, but you can, uh, one thing is you can expect some spillover effects, you know, so I will just now make reference to another uh, survey that was, okay, it was a commission for political purposes, but still, it showed us that, for instance, in Serbia, uh, how citizens form their opinions. Uh, they mostly rely on, on public TV, we knew that, that was not a surprise, so they mostly, they take information from television, but then they form their opinions and their political practices based on how they discuss this information with their peers and with their surroundings. So they, dis they tend to discuss and to, to kind of test their opinions and to, for, to, to, kind of, to, to finalize their opinions based on discussion with their peer groups or with their colleagues or with their neighbors or whatever. So we could expect that if we have more and more of these kind of deliberative arena that people will talk outside them and that we will have some sort of a spillover effect. So it's, but of course we have to start first and foremost from the premise that it's not a cure for all the, you know, the, the, these kind of the, the innovations will not cure all the democratic deficiencies. We have to accept that. And uh, what Stefan was talking about, it was uh, always debated the question, right? People don't have the same amount of privileges, if you will, like they, they are not, they don't have the, the same position. And there were some attempts to overcome these problems. So not only the people would get paid, they would get vouchers or whatever that 
uh, babysitting services would be organized for moms so they can come with their children. Or if you have minorities or language minorities, we have translators for them to facilitate. But even though whatever measures you take, there will, be, there will always be some people who are uh, not fully uh, capable to, in, to, to be present in the same capacity as everyone else. And we have to admit it, 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 that there are some deficiencies. I think that's the best thing to, to start with that and to be aware of all the, uh, all the limitations and to try to then overcome with them with some different measures. Right. Um, do we have more questions from the audience? Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just a sec. Hey, Roger. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Roger Berkowitz um, from Bard College. So this is, I mean, it's for anyone, I guess, but for Jeanne and, and and Don Air. Both of, I think, I think all the citizen assemblies you, you discussed, although I'm not sure about the most I want, um, were organized not by governments, but by civil associations. Um, you know, I know that in, in now in Paris, you have a permanent civil assembly, and in Belgium, East Belgium, you have some. I'm wondering to what extent you think this movement has to move towards um, having governments actually, having these become part of a government, uh, part of a governing and legal structure, or how much you think it should stay on the outside. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you both have said that, uh, you know, one of the big uh, limits is, is, is it, it, meets, it meets its limits when, when the representatives and the government officials don't participate or, or resist. Uh, I'm just wondering to what extent you think this can be incorporated into a government structure here in, in, in Central Europe. Thank you so much. We have one more question right in front of you. Hi. Uh, it's, yeah. Nenad Markovic, uh, Political Science Department, Faculty of Law, Skopje. Um, I have a comment in regards to the first uh, presentation. Uh, I'm not surprised to see, in fact, that people in regimes that incline more toward autocracy than democracy feel, at least on that levels of perception, more satisfied with democracy or less inclined to express dissatisfaction, if I understood correctly. Um, there is this um, term by Rumiana Kolarova, the Bulgarian transitologist. She, she fantastically explains that autocratic regimes sometimes are the masters of uh, politics of psychological satisfaction. So I'm completely not surprised by, by the fact that people express less concern in this regard, to put it widely, to define it widely. Um, they're master of sedatization of people. So basically, maybe we overestimate sometimes when we perceive the people as some kind of generic category, what they expect and what they want, because we apply our own standards on the general public opinion, which is always a mistake that we and I subconsciously do, it's also not a mistake, it's maybe also an ideological standpoint because we tend to advocate what we fight for. We cannot simply accept this concept of sedatization, and I absolutely personally can't, and it frustrates me sometimes. But do you think that, um, for all the panelists, why not? Do you think that this, this is a possible explanation of why people in regimes that are more, hub, more hybrid than democratic, more autocratic than democratic, uh, express less concern? with the concept of their democracy, because as you said, there is appetite for, um, for deliberation. It connects to, to, to this point, but there is no, um, if I understood correctly, uh, execution of this appetite very often. Maybe it's connected to this politics of psychological satisfaction, because I think that there are people in the region we used to also have this kind of leader until recently, which really can hit the soft spots of public opinion and effectively address them from the perspective of political spin or whatever, what, what have you, any technique that you would usually use to, to make people feel that everything is all right. Thank you so much. I'll just check if there are more questions. Okay, that's okay. Stefan, a follow up. Okay, just, just be quick, please. And let this be our final question for today. Um, I actually wanted to follow up on what the colleague uh -huh. from Skopje said, uh, just very briefly. Uh, is, uh, I want to say that perhaps it's not always a mirage, the psychological satisfaction, but that 
uh, these regimes also have some sort of mechanisms. I don't know if we would call them participatory, but you know, like public transport workers in Novi Sad, they figured out that you know you should start threatening a strike before the elections because even though you have a party state, they still want good election results. So, uh, if you could also reflect on these kinds of methods applied by the regimes themselves that we would perhaps call autocratic in some ways, but are still having some participatory methods. So what is the potential of uh, these democratic innovations becoming parts of government structures? Not only that, but if I understood the question correctly, it's also should be, in mm -hmm. sense, like, uh, because there's a different, I mean, especially in hybrid regimes, there's a danger that of of course, like in China, we have some citizens' assemblies, and then you can use them as a way of legitimizing uh, your uh, policy making uh, uh, habits. And you could say, well, you look, we organize all sorts of participatory mechanisms, but then they are controlled and then they're put in a different setting. So it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a legitimate question to ask do we really want to insist on these uh, participatory mechanisms and to include governmental bodies and to hold them responsible? Or do we actually want to insist on them? As as a uh, as side thing, as something that we organize uh, from civil society or academia, and because we want citizens to practice and we want them to feel empowered and we want them. It's, it's, uh, uh, I really don't have an answer to that. I think that we should insist that participatory mechanisms should be also part of the, the governing. I mean, that it should not only be a practice, not something that we are, we are doing in our spare time to, to practice our citizens. Capabilities. I think that we should insist on that because we also hope that there will be a regime change, so we will not always be a hybrid regime. I hope so. So uh, I think that uh, we should, like uh, policy-wise, insist on participatory mechanisms as part of, of governing. Uh, but uh, we should also be careful uh, oh. when in hybrid regimes and in autocratic regimes, when authorities actually. Uh, uh, implement participatory mechanisms, we should always be uh, very careful about the particular context of how this is uh, played out. And maybe briefly on this uh, uh, sedation and imitation that, that Nenad was talking about, I think that, and uh, I think it's, we actually, uh, uh, we need to have more uh, empirical research about what people mean when they say they're satisfied. I think we're really lacking that. So we have these surveys and we have these perceptions, but they don't really tell us much. You know, so when people say, okay, I'm satisfied. But when you sit and talk to them, then you can, through their answers, you can see that they're really not satisfied. And I think that we really lack this deep understanding of how citizens really feel the politics is being done and are they really satisfied with their lives and the ways that, you know, there's this, uh, uh, the, uh, I'll just make this brief comment and then I'll stop. There, there, there was this meme, like an internet meme or whatever, with, with an old woman in, in Serbia and the reporter came to her and said, how are you, grandma? How are you? And she's, I'm fine, I'm perfect. And she says, talking about, and she ends with, and I will hang myself. <laughs> so I'm fine, with, but so you, we have to talk to people, actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I get the meme. Um, first to Roger's question, I mean, about this institutionalization of citizens' assemblies. Um, you have this Ostbelgian model, which basically uses them as a separate institution in parallel to elected officials. Um, I'm not sure that's really the best way to do it. I mean, it's still something that we're sort of trying to figure out what's the best way to do it. Uh, Brussels has a more, at least what I would say, a more innovative model of having these institutions, citizens' assemblies, institutionalized, but only with half of citizens and the other half are actually the elected officials. And this is where you bring the dialogue aspect in so that you cannot see them as a separate and legitimizing institution, which you can possibly in China pack with your own supporters, but you necessarily bring in the dialogue between citizens and, and elected officials. And I think this is much more healthy for a democracy to let officials engage with citizens much more actively. Of course, you need to follow all the criteria of having the sortition, having these citizens pretty much representing the broader population and not just a particular group or so. Um, I'm not sure that it uh, would work everywhere. That's the second thing. You do need at least some level of commitment from elected officials. In our region, it might be applicable on the local level, um, in cities, in smaller communities. At the national level, we see that it just doesn't work yet. So there's no 
um, no effort to engage with citizens in any meaningful way, and not at, not, not at all with citizens' assemblies. Um, so yes, but the thing is, by practicing it very often at these local levels, you might get the expectation from citizens that this is a possible way to do democracy. So by repeating it mm -hmm. ad nauseum, mm -hmm. you get the idea that you as a citizen can participate in some kind of policy making, and I think that's valuable. Uh, to Nenad's question, yes, yeah, strong leaders. I mean, this is something that you can see in a lot of polls that people sort of find very relevant. Second thing that they find very relevant is corruption. And they link these two together. I mean, democracy here is built not just on democratic institutions, but on informality. The way that you do democracy is informal, through party structures, through sort of knowledge networks, networks of people you know. And this is also something that people equate with democracy. So which party do you belong to equals who you're going to vote for, equals the jobs that you might have access to, and so on and so forth. This, in the informality aspect of democracy, needs to be separated. And I think that's key, because democracy here relies on these informal mechanisms to obtain power and to remain in power. Once you have more transparency sort of <laughs> shoved into the system, you might move away from this um, informal, more authoritarian view of democracy, and maybe even it becoming a bit more critical, which is good in our sense. Um, yeah, I would just like to um, respond to the, this concept of sedation. I'm very um, critical of, or kind of uh, attentive uh, in using these kind of concepts. Uh, primarily because I believe that people are not really sedated. Like even people who vote for these authoritarian leaders know exactly what kind of problems they have in their lives. Uh, and uh, they, know, they have an experience of authentic problems uh, and they handle them in various ways. And one of the ways they handle them is to just say, well, this is how it is and this is something we cannot influence uh, and what I believe is if, if we use this, this term of sedation, this is where sedation is, in this idea that we are helpless uh, and that we are just going to, you know, muddle through our precarious lives and, you know, it's going to be how it's going to be. Uh, and I think actually Elena's uh, great point about this uh, grandmother who ends up with hanging herself is actually a case in point. Uh, people are kind of just, you know, accepting that uh, life is hard. <laughs> and I think this is the point where organizing steps in and where it thrives on this kind of authentic knowledge people have of their experience and pushes them to uh, relate this experience to certain structures. Uh, and I, I think in that sense, this is the way to address the, the issue of sedation. Okay, Will, would you like to reflect on the yeah, questions maybe just, we just a short, the short, yeah. maybe just to respond to your question. Um, I think there's probably a myriad of factors that might affect this. I, I don't know what the answer is, but it's interesting to speculate a little bit. I guess one of the problems is this aggregation fallacy. You know, it's a one good thing, and then below it, it's ten bad things. So it might be the case. I mean, I don't know. And the other thing is, of course, uh, preference falsification. And we know that uh, polls in you know, authoritarian regimes tend to distort the real sentiments of population a lot. So it might be to that. These are measurements of political attitudes in an environment which is highly polarized. People might be saying things because they think it's socially desirable. Um, but I do think that, that what really drives this is the satisfaction of being on the winning side. I mean, everybody wants to be on the winning side. Nobody wants to be on the losing side. And then it's just a matter of how the authoritarian regime segments the voting body. And th this is why I, I wanted to mention the, the urban-rural divide, and then my colleagues hate me for constantly talking about this. But, uh, but uh, uh, I, it's interesting when we talk about you know, uh, participatory innovations, you know, how, how do we approach people who might be satisfied with how democracy works? You know, there's no demand. And here in urban areas, there is high demand, but, but these are also people who are going to be um, less listened to by the national authorities. So there's this gap that I think we might, we might want to uh, discuss. Um, I'll stop there. I, I don't want to add. Did you want to add something? OK. I don't hate you, Boy. <laughs> and I see you also don't hate him, or you wanted to add something? Yeah, 
we do, we have two more minutes. Okay. We have plenty of time. <laughs> It's very interesting that Captain Books of Claudian actually opened, and I'm not sure what is the answer, as you all don't know also. But what we know, like, for example, what is, for me, an optimistic view that with democratic, you know, participatory democratic innovation, we can actually do something in this kind of political context, is that uh, we know that in developed democracies, uh, where also there is a low trust in institutions and, and uh, et cetera, uh, what is... Uh, what we find out is that there is a sense of political efficacy, a sense of political efficacy. Oh, is this, is this, yeah, because you're, you're insisting on this talking about perceptions, but it's, it's sense, so it's perception. Uh, political efficacy is increasing after participating in, in. And so now we have 15 years of research showing that, that people are more willing to participate after they already participated in this. Uh, for this region, this is a novelty, we are just trying. But uh, what uh, makes me feel that it, it, that it, can, it can work is uh, actually exactly those things we are talking about when we talk about the state of democracy. We don't have a space for dialogue. Uh, people are, don't have a, a sense of political efficacy at the high levels. And they don't have a space actually to reflect on what is democracy and what, how they can contribute. And my feeling is that, because I, I, I've observed and studied many experiences in other countries where you see people after the, this democratic innovation that they can feel, they want to contribute. They start to, to, to participate at the local level in democracy. And this is somehow this, uh, uh, if we see democratic innovation and in, 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 uh, that they have two goals, one is to uh, make a democratic decision and the other one is to this educational thing in country, in this context where we, we didn't have a space for, where we are politically socialized actually in non-democracies, we don't have a long tradition of democracies. This is uh, the, the only, uh, if we compare it to the vote as institutions, this is, institutions that offer much more in terms of education for democracy. This is why I think there is a hope uh, that this could possibly work if we start from the local level. This is some comment, this is what I wanted to say. Thank you so much. And I want to thank our speakers now and the audience for an excellent dis discussion. Uh, we will have a coffee break until 11.15 on the first floor. And after that, I invite you to join us for the first thematic panel on institutional models of participatory democratic innovation is also on the first floor. So we're going to yeah. Thank you. Thank you.